Hello and welcome to Planetary Imaging and Processing Part 4. My name is Doug Hubble and today we are going to discuss how to process the solar surface. My original video I had this data here that was kind of okay but not really the best. Fortunately, Houston Haynes has provided new data that's much better than mine that you can download in the comments section below. And also, Houston Haynes will show us the step-by-step -step process how to get these results. Houston also has a very nice solar imaging processing channel and I highly recommend subscribing to his channel. I'll put a link right up here in the corner. So, it's on to Houston now. Hi everybody, thanks Doug for the introduction. So in this tutorial I'm going to be demonstrating how to process your surface data and then process your prominence data because those two uh, images should be processed slightly different. Um, so you'd have something that looks like this for your surface. You know, obviously we can see the sunspot, the filament, uh, and all of the detail that's on the actual disk. But then we want to really bring out the prominences so you know, you're going to film the sun to make it look something like this. So you're overexposing on the camera, but by doing so, all the little faint uh, prominences will, will, will show up. And of course, we want to combine both surface and prominence so we can get the surface detail and the prominence. So that's what we're going to be doing, but in this video, I'm just going to be concentrating on the surface data. And for the surface data, I like to use a program called AutoStackert, and I think Doug will put a uh, link uh, in the description to download. It is a free program and uh, I really I highly recommend using this for your surface uh, data. Uh, prominence data would be a little different. I like to use Registacks for the prominence data. Uh, but for the surface data, yeah, try, try AutoStacker. It's really good. So let's go ahead and open up AutoStacker and I'll run through processing these, these two AVI files. So I'm going to be batch processing. And just to note, as you can tell, I can't fit a full disk into the field of view due to my focal length in the telescope and the, the chip size of the camera. Uh, I can't fit a full disk, so I'm going to have to blend and merge these together in Photoshop uh, after we stack and align them. So just keep that in mind. Even if, if you do have a full disk image, then don't worry about that. Uh, it's a really quick step, anyways, and you know it doesn't take too long. So uh, let me uh, stop talking and uh, let's open up AutoStacker. Okay, we got uh, auto stacker opened. Let's uh, click number one, open. <clears throat> and of course, I'm going to be using these two, surface one, surface two. And you can just, you can click on each one or you know, your arrow. Like I said, you can, you can batch process as many files as you want, so it's really nice. Click open. And on the right here, it's going to load the first frame from the API file. And we need to find a good anchor point. Unlike Registacks, we don't need to run through the frames to have a reference point. That's going to be done later in uh, AutoStacker. Right now, we just need to anchor uh, for the uh, initial uh, stabilization and, and, and analysis. So you can just press Control, and then I'm going to click center on that sunspot. That's a good anchor point. Let's find a prominent feature. You know, you could use a, 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 a filament like this. That'll work. But I'm going to use that prominence. So let's go back over here. And under image stabilization, make sure surface is checked off. For the stack size, I'm going to crop. Uh, the crop will crop out a lot of area, but the problem with expand is I'm trying to blend two separate images together later on in Photoshop. And the expand option clips a lot of the data. And so you'd have to go in by hand and crop it yourself eventually. So I'm just going to go ahead and use the crop option. But just be beware, it does crop quite a bit out. It shouldn't. It that's that distance between the edge and my the edge of the disc and the edge of the frame it'll probably crop to the half halfway point so I can afford that obviously I wouldn't want to do that with the prominence because I don't want to crop out any data but anyway yeah I'm gonna use crop and for a quality estimator always use gradient and for the noise robust number uh, start with number three and then we're just gonna click analyze <coughs> And this won't take too long. AutoStacker auto is really quick, especially if you download the newest version, which I believe is 2.2. .2. 
Uh, it's really quick. It's a lot quicker than his original uh, auto stacker. Uh, he's made a lot of improvements. So once this finishes analyzing, we're going to have a quality graph pop up, and we need to analyze that quality graph. Okay, so there's our quality graph, and it's not that great. I mean, I'm going to have to work with this, but it's not ideal. What you'd really want is all this squiggly stuff to be above the 50% line, and you'd want that green line, which is kind of like, I think it's like a best fit kind of smoothing line. You want it to be above that 50% blue line the entire time, and then at the very end, dip down. That would be perfect. But let me demonstrate what happens is, what, what, what you could do if your quality is pretty low, you can increase your noise robust, let's say to number four, and click analyze, and watch what happens to the graph. It's gonna run through these two steps again. Sorry for uh, making you watch this, but Basically, when I increase my noise robust range, uh, we should see a, a shift upwards in the data, uh, improving our quality. It might not, but let's let's just take a look. Yeah, there you go. Do you see that? There's a little a little shift upwards. So it wasn't that much of a shift, and actually, it could be worse because the variance has increased. So the you know the distance between a trough, the trough and a peak has kind of stretched out more. And that's not good. We don't want to be stretching it out. We want it to be kind of, you know, consistent and high above the 50% threshold. So I'm really not getting a better quality by changing my noise robust number. So I'm going to go back to number three. But I just wanted to demonstrate that because it's a very good tool to use. Um, but, you know, if you're just starting off, uh, just stick with number three. Okay, I won't make you watch that again. I'll get back to you once it's finished. Okay, so Otter Stackard has finished analyzing. And before I go up and start placing align points, uh, let me just show you the reference frame down here in the bottom left corner and what this means. Uh, when you first run through your files, you you have to do auto size quality based because basically what, what it does is it's going to automatically create a reference frame by stacking, I think, around 50 frames and then use that reference frame for the uh, stacking process, just like VGStacks does. But after you have done this once, you can come back through again and reload the AVI file and click last stack is reference. So you're actually gonna, your reference frame will be the entire stack uh, from the end of this process we're doing here. So uh, it, it might not change it much at all, but it could be a slight improvement. So you can mess around with that later on. But first, let's just do the initial uh, stacking. And of course we have to do with the auto size quality based. Uh, for your stack options, uh, save, make sure they're saved as TIFF files. And for a frame percentage, uh, I have read that 30% works really well for hydrogen alpha, and that's what I use. So 30% of your frames, and hopefully, you know, you need to be capturing around 1,000 frames. Um, you don't want to go too high. If you're recording too long, you're going to get the shift in, uh, you know, the solar features, because it's, you know, dynamic enough to where even after 60 seconds of recording, you know, you could have... Uh, plasma and filaments moving around and so we don't want that to distort our image just like you know imaging Jupiter you know Jupiter is the fastest rotating planet in the solar system so you know you can't just sit there and record it over and over and over so we want to gather data but we don't want to gather too much so you know I like 500 frames is good too so maybe between 500 and a thousand I always you know do a thousand usually um, so yeah 30 percent of that so the best 30 percent of that thousand frames are going to get stacked and aligned and stacked um, don't do sharpened. There's no, right, there's no really need for that because we're going to do all of our own processing. And of course you can change the prefix of the file. And then for the advanced settings, make sure HQ refine is checked. Um, it will take a little longer to stack, but, uh, it's highly, it's highly precise. It's a lot more precise if you don't use, I mean, if you use this and you don't need to use drizzle. So let's go over here and replace our line points. And we want to automatically place the line points. Um, and I have a lot of detail in these frames, so I'm going to use a small line point size, something around 30. And I'm going to click place apps and grid. As you can see, it's nicely put all the line points in there. And uh, yeah, that, I think that's a good size. Uh, the minimum is 25. I don't think I need to go that small. But if you don't have a lot of data uh, and the conditions weren't that great, you might need to use a larger line point size. Let me demonstrate what that looks like. So the boxes around the 
individual line points are larger, so there's more space in between the line points. So uh, this is good for, you know, kind of blank uh, canvases. You don't have a lot of detail. But I mean, like, I'm, I'm getting a lot of detail on my images, so let's bump it down to 30 again. Place apps and grid. And once you've done that, all you need to do now is go back over here and click number three, stack. And that is it right there. So we just finished stacking and aligning. Well, we haven't finished, but the program will batch process both of those files using these settings. Um, oops. And uh, yeah, it shouldn't take too long. Uh, a thousand frames. Uh, it goes by really quick. Actually, I was just going to stop the recording, but let me show you how fast this runs through it. It's actually pretty impressive. Um, I would have to say this beats Regi stacks in terms of speed. Okay, so AutoStacker has finished both stacking and aligning these two AVI files, and it'll say done right here in the frame view window. And it'll conveniently put a folder in the same location where you uploaded your AVI files, and it'll say AS, P, and that number will be your line point size, and then multi because I batch processed. And so you're here are my two AVI files now converted into TIFF files that we can post process. I uh, wanted to show you real quick though, under the debug, uh, debug, uh, debug data folder, um, you'll see where it says last uh, reference frame. Um, interestingly enough, uh, I'm only getting one reference frame. Hmm, should get two. But the point is, is you can re go back into AutoStacker and open up. Uh, uh, whatever AVI file you just finished uh, processing and then click down here last stack is reference and it'll use this last reference frame so it's just a higher quality reference frame so it could improve your image it might not but I just wanted to uh, demonstrate that but it kind of looks like you can't batch process because it's only loading up the very last AVI file as a reference frame so that's pretty interesting okay so we have our, our two images what I'm gonna do here real quick is um, go into Photoshop and then and blend these images together to create a full disk image. So if you have a full disk already, you can go ahead and skip ahead to the uh, sharpening and you know, the processing stuff. So let me open up Photoshop real quick. Okay, I'm in Photoshop. Now to do the photo merge, it's pretty simple. Go to File, Automate, Photo Merge. Make sure all boxes down here are checked. Go back to distortion correction. We make the removal and image together, and the layout is auto. Now we just need to browse and find those files. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So here are my two TIFF. Open both of these, and it'll list them right here. Click OK. And this shouldn't really take too long. Um, as long as you have enough data and overlap between each uh, uh, AVI file or your, your final TIFF images, it should blend them uh, pretty pretty well. Uh, you can do it. There's a you can do it by hand, uh, but I have found that the photo merge works really well and quick, and it's very simple. There you go. See, you did all the work for me, and it blended it really nicely. But let's uh, flatten out the image, and let me go ahead and. Um, Know, color in some of these whoop, color in the these edges okay whoop, shoot Do that. Now, normally um, I would start processing here in Photoshop but I wanted to show you a really good technique to use before we start in Photoshop so after you have blended your image together you got a full disk click file and then save it as a TIFF whatever name you want I'll save this as full disk FD okay now, what we want to do is let's go into Ouija Stacks 5. So, hopefully, you have this program too. It's free as well. And in Ouija Stacks, let's open up that full disk image that I just uh, saved. Sorry to make you watch me navigate through all my messy desktop. And of course, we want to change your file type to TIFF.
and there's our full disk image that we just blended in Photoshop. Open that up. Uh, don't stretch the intensity levels. Alrighty, and I'm gonna let's see here. Zoom out. So just like you would in Registax, I'm gonna bump up the wavelets a little bit, but unlike uh, kind of other processing, I'm only gonna use layer one, two, and three. Normally I would use the five and six, but one, two, and three. Uh, Gaussian. And here's the trick. Go over to Wavelet Filter tab, click on that, and change your center value to 1000. Click Set. Okay. I'm actually going to zoom back in so we can see our changes. And um, now we just start to mess with the Wavelet Filters. We don't want to go too high because we're going to do most of our processing in Photoshop. But let's say, let's do number 10 on, on around 10 for layer 1. Uh, oops, sorry about that. My recording cut out on me. Uh, anyway, we, we set our wavelet filter center value. We're on uh, Gaussian. And um, yeah, like I said, uh, start bumping up layers 1, 2, and 3, but not too much. So I'm going to do 10. Or let's do 15, actually. It could be quite a bit. Maybe too much. Let's change number 2 to around... I'm sure, 6. And number 3 to around 3, 4. That's fine. Oh, uh, that actually looks like I'm, I'm, if you can see here, let me click do all. Uh, we're starting to sharpen it too much. I don't want to over sharpen this. So let's, uh, let's take number one down to a value of around 10. And this down to around three. Let's take this down to, well, let's just leave that on one. Let's see what we got here. Mm, still seems a sharp, a little too sharp. Uh, I think we could work with this. And I'm going to take it down again. I'm going to have to take layer one down to around five. Yeah, that's a little better. Uh, the point is, I really just do not want to over sharpen in with wavelets because I want to use smart sharpen in Photoshop in them. Um, there's a certain amount that I want to use in Photoshop, so I definitely don't want to over sharpen. So that's good right there. And you don't have to do this technique. We can just do all the sharpening in Photoshop, but I recommend trying this. It's really cool. So let's save the image. I'm just going to overwrite that last one. Okay, now let's just go back into Photoshop. Like this and reopen that file. Cool. So now we have. Um, up slightly in Registax, so we're really ready to start the bulk of the post processing. So let's begin. Uh, step number one is always sharpening, and I like to use Smart Sharpen, and I like to start at 275% with a radius of 1, and I use the more accurate feature. You can see when I toggle that, so here is without the more accurate, and watch it when I click the more accurate. It's just a slightly little more fine. And if you look at our full disk, it's looking pretty good. So click OK. Now let's apply a unsharp mask. So back to filter, sharpen, unsharp mask. Let's do 25% with a radius of 2. And I have to thank, uh, I think, Mark Townley. Uh, maybe it's not Mark Townley, but another guy on Stargazer's Lounge who recommended these values, and they do work pretty well for a wide variety of telescopes and cameras. Let's try these settings out. So now we've sharpened just even enough, even just even more. Click OK. As you can see, a lot of good detail in there. Looks really good. And the good thing is we don't have a lot of gradients either. So let's try and apply some filters. We can sharpen it even more by using this uh, soft light. So press Control J to duplicate your layer. And I apologize ahead of time if I cut out uh, abruptly because of my recording device. Like just quit on me. So press Control J and duplicate my layer. Now let's change our blending mode to soft light. And filter, other bypass. See the effect that high pass had. Uh, start with a value of around 15. 
that's a good starting value. Sometimes I have to go higher. But let me toggle that real quick so you can see. So that was before the high pass. That's with the high pass. Click OK. So the high pass helped a little bit. It brought up more contrast. Let's right click on our layers and flatten it out. Now let's do a noise medium filter. Now the noise medium filter is good if you have a lot of gradients. Uh, it, it will kind of flatten out the image a little bit. You know, but we're the sun's a sphere, so we don't want to flatten it out too much. But I would not actually apply a flattening uh, a median filter to this image because it looks really good already. But I'm going to go ahead and just demonstrate. Control J, change your blending mode to prints, filter, noise, median, and a radius of 30 is always good to start with. You might need a little more. Click OK. Now we need to bring it out, so press Control M for mic, and that'll bring up our curves. So now we just need to change our preset. Uh, you can drag the actual curve, put a, put a point and darken the layer, but the preset works really well. Click on darker. See that? So we brought it out, but let's do it a couple more times. Control M, darker. Let me show you what you don't want is, um, I like, I stopped doing the darkening once all the sunspots have been refilled with, with black. Yeah, that's hollow, so let's press Control M, reset, darker, and maybe one more time, Control M, reset, darker, and that looks pretty good. And if you don't want to continue to darken the disk, um, you can just fill in the, um, the sunspot data. I'm actually going to do it one no, I'm not going to do it, that's good right there. And the point of applying that noise medium filter is we're actually bringing out a lot more contrast um, while at the same time kind of diminishing a lot of gradients. So let's flatten out this image. And now, since we did darken it that much, let's bring it up. Let's bring levels up. Control L for levels. And then you want to take you know your highlight slider all the way to the edge of the histogram. Or, you know, a number that suits you and is not too bright or too dark. Um, 200 I like a lot, sometimes maybe a little lower, like to 180. I'm going to do, let's do 185 for this demonstration. Yeah, that looks good right there. So we've effectively sharpened the disc uh, by using Smart Sharpen and Unsharp Mask. And we've also applied a, a high pass filter. And we applied a noise median filter to darken the disc and bring out a little more contrast. I think I'm going to end it there. That's uh, really a bulk of processing. What we need to do next is process the prominence layers, of course, and then blend those two images. And then I'll go through color and a few other adjustments uh, once we have the prominence layer and the surface layer and nice blended together. But, yeah, the data should be available for you to download. Hopefully, it's not too large of a file. Um, you can practice these techniques yourself on these files. And you can, you know, change some stuff up, you know, do different sharpening techniques, whatever. It's very subjective. So, but might as well start with the basics. Uh, yeah, there you go. We've got a great full piece of image with loads of detail on it. Yeah, join me next time and I'll go through uh, some prominence tutorials. All right, guys, take it easy. Thanks for watching. And if this is your first time watching, I'd like you to subscribe to my channel. I publish two astrophotography videos every month on the 1st and 15th. In our next video, Houston Haynes will lead us on processing the solar prominences. So come by next for part five and see how this is done. Don't forget to subscribe to Houston's channel as well. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you soon. Goodbye.